the English are suffering an identity crisis. Just look at the national flag. It's there for big sporting events. It flies from the top of church towers. But there are others with their own ideas about Englishness who also use it. Keep the fight up for our country. This ancient flag and its people face some hard choices. At a time when society, religion and politics are increasingly diverse, in a nation of many faiths and none, what's it mean to be English? In this series, I've been looking at English identity, at the idea that the English are somehow superior, specially chosen by God to play a big part on the world stage. Because after all, the English knew that they were God's chosen people, just like ancient Israel, only better. And at the idea that the faith of the English created a specially tolerant people. You can't imagine this happening in England, can you? In my final programme, I'll be examining an even more basic and difficult debate. One point of view is that Englishness has an ethnic core. True Englishmen and women take their roots from the people of the Dark Ages, the Anglo-Saxons. And until recently, it also seemed obvious that to be truly English was to be Christian. And maybe not just any Christian, but Church of England. Some people still find such settled images compelling. You might just dismiss them without discussion. Look around at the sheer variety of ethnic faces that make up the English today. But I want to ask a deeper question. Was this ever true? In this series, I've been arguing that God made the English. But did he also make them white and Christian? What it means to be English is something that arouses strong emotion. Like the outburst of fury directed at Manchester Cathedral's canon theologian. For three months um, we received a um, regular flow of emails, uh, letters, um, telephone messages. What did they say? I have been told that I am a very evil man, um, a traitor, that I should resign, that I should disappear. It was all because the canon blessed a 12-foot model of England's patron saint. But this is not your stereotype white crusader, sword in hand. This St George is black. What this figure does is to challenge some basic notions about English identity, about the racial and cultural traits we call someone's ethnic roots. For some, St George is a powerful symbol of what it means to be ethnically English. He's an icon of patriotic self-confidence. But the history of St George is complicated and it can tell us a great deal about what it really means to be English. might not expect me to go to Israel to start my search. But according to local tradition, this town of Elid, which the Israelis now call Lud, was the home of the English saint. The story of George is that he was a soldier in the Roman army. But when the Emperor Diocletian began persecuting Christians, George objected. He was in prison for his defiance and eventually killed. This 
church is on the spot where he's said to be buried. So, it's in a Middle Eastern crypt that you'll find the English saint. And straight away, you see what we all remember about St George, the soldier saint. And that's what appealed to kings of England from the 13th century. Soon, the royal spin doctors were making him the symbol of the nation. They gave George a makeover. Out went the Roman armor, and instead, he donned the chain mail and tabard of an English crusader. But that's not how he's remembered here. He's very much a Middle Eastern saint. Well, Father, tell me a little about the place of St. George in Lod. Yes, St. George is uh, widely venerated among the Christian community. The members of our congregation dedicate their children by dressing them up in a uh, costume which is similar to, to St. George's clothes. They also name their children after St. George. And that's why we've got a lot of grown-ups and kids today that are called George or Jurius. Jurius is also the, the parallel to, to St. George. What do you think about the idea that the English want St. George to be English? He's considered to be a local saint in many, many communities. The same thing happens in Greece as well. Uh, the Greeks th think that he's a Greek uh, saint or the Russians think that he's a Russian saint and uh, also the Palestinians think that, he that he's a Palestinian saint. Uh, I know that in England uh, St. George is considered to be an English uh, or, or from England but no he isn't. He's not, I mean he might be venerated in the Western Church but, but he's not from England. So on any reckoning, St. George is ethnically Mediterranean or Middle Eastern. For the people in this town, he's an Arab. But perhaps the most surprising thing of all is that he's not just a hero for Christians here. He's also admired by Muslims. Maha is a Muslim. Her family traditionally joined with their Christian neighbours to celebrate St. George. They would light candles and even pray to the Christian saint for help. Christian and Muslim used to live uh, in Elid as, as a one family. My mother and uh, my grandmother take uh, olive oil uh, as a gift uh, for the uh, church and St. St. George and ask him to help them. So St. George is a symbol of unity between different communities for you? Yes, yes he, he is. Now this may surprise you but some people, English people, think that St. George is English. Mm -hmm. This is uh, surprising me. Actually this is the first time that I, I heard that but I, I think it's very uh, natural uh, behaviour because uh, Human beings, if they uh, love a holy symbol, they want it uh, to belong to them. But uh, unfortunately, I have to tell them that it is from a lid. <laughs> <laughs> After hearing all the noisy argument about St. George in England, I find it refreshing that here he can be seen as a symbol of friendship between Muslims and Christians. <laughs> St George isn't the property of any one people. He's a patron saint of England, but he's the patron saint of Gozo in the Mediterranean, the Republic of Georgia up in the Caucasus. St George is a hero to all sorts of people. His legend neatly sums up the muddle that is English identity. St George is not who many people think he is, and neither are the English. So let's take a closer look at English ethnic identity. One of the most persistent ideas about the English is that they descend from Northern Europeans who made this island their home back in the so-called Dark Ages. The Anglo-Saxons. It's a potent idea. It shapes the thinking of nationalist parties and many besides. But how true is it?
The traditional story is that Englishness was brought by invaders when the Roman Empire collapsed. Germanic tribes swept into the country. Angles, Saxons, Jutes. They pushed out the previous peoples of these islands, the original Britons, into what are now Wales and Scotland. On that basis, the ancestors of the English would be the Anglo-Saxons. And in the 21st century, we now have the science to discover if that is true. I'm taking a DNA test to find out about the genetic makeup of my ancestors. And I'm going to look at the results with a man who's used DNA to trace the origins of the British. Stephen Oppenheimer first explained how his research works. There are two particular parts of our genome which are very useful for this approach. One of those parts is the Y chromosome, uh, which only males have and is passed down the male line, and the other is mitochondrial DNA, which we all have, but is passed down the female line. So that's very neat. You've got two parts of our genome which gives us a male line of descent and the other gives us a female line of descent. Well, I've had a DNA test, and what does that tell you about my origins? Well, um, if we take the, the Y chromosome to, to start off with, which you get from your father, uh, it originates in northern Spain, in the Basque country, oh. um, during the Ice Age, uh, which was 18,000 years ago. And uh, you can see, and this is actually a, a map showing the distribution of the type that you have. Yeah. And it's extremely common along the Atlantic coast. In fact, it's the commonest single type. And uh, it arrives in Britain just under 10,000 years ago. Right. So. Well, you've told me about one average strand. Well, what about the other one? That's just as average. Oh. In fact, it's very similar in its, uh, in its prehistory. Okay. And again, the distribution of this is very similar to your Y chromosome. Right. The origin is in northern Spain in the Basque country, and it moves up the Atlantic coast into Britain. It, it arrives rather similarly to your, your Y chromosome um, just under 10,000 years ago. Well, so you're basically telling me I'm pretty average. Mr. <laughs> average, yes. <laughs> but, um, that's, that, but that's a very good illustration that a lot of people will, will have that, that sort of picture. Yes, and the picture is quite a surprising one. We, we started in northern Spain, then we were up here. What's going on here? The ice started melting about 15,500 years ago, and quite a few people moved up into northern Europe, although it was still pretty cold, from refuges along the, the north coast of the Mediterranean. And for Western Europe, uh, the main refuge was in the Basque country. So this is nothing like the story of Anglo-Saxon England and its invasion. It's much older. Yes, and the Anglo-Saxon contribution, uh, in my analysis, is, is only 5% for the whole of England. 5% contribution of the Anglo-Saxons to the supposed English. That's right. And the English are much closer to the Welsh, the Irish, the Cornish and, uh, and the Scottish than they are to any other continental population. And this, this idea of the English coming in as a race, or the Anglo-Saxons coming in as a race, really uh, just, just doesn't hold up in the, uh, in, in the genetic view. So, according to genetic science, the roots of the English are not Anglo-Saxon, but Spanish. And if that isn't surprising enough, the English are also very close genetically to the Irish, the Welsh and the Scots. Before outrage sweeps the home nations, let me say it's clear there's more to identity than genetics alone. The English may owe little to the Anglo-Saxons genetically, but don't they still owe a great deal culturally? Isn't the English way of life and way of thinking indebted to the people from Germany? Here, archaeology can provide some answers. This excavation of an Anglo-Saxon village is providing useful insights into the beginnings of Englishness. See this one that you've just done in Digi, and then we'll work the way back. Neil Faulkner is leading the dig. 
Well, this chap is a warrior, which we know from the, the battle injuries that he has uh, suffered. Um, if you look at this leg bone, you can see that it's broken almost certainly from a kick or the blow of a weapon. Uh, he seems to have a very serious wound on this shoulder, as if part of it has been sheared away. And if he's not already dying, what would unquestionably have finished him off would be this sword slash yeah. across the skull. Well, he sounds like a classic Anglo-Saxon warrior, then. Well, he's Anglo-Saxon in the sense that he's been integrated into Anglo-Saxon society, but that's not quite the same as saying that his ancestors are from... Germany. Oh, so he's British. Uh, so, so how does that work? Well, I think he probably is British. I mean, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us is that they were coming over in really quite small numbers of people, two or three longboats. And you can get about 30, 40, 50 people into a longboat. Well, that means it's actually quite a small number of warriors who are coming in in the 5th century AD. So most of the people that we think of as Anglo-Saxon are actually British people who've been integrated into Anglo-Saxon society. The Anglo-Saxons did not colonise England in huge numbers. There never was a mass invasion. Out on the dig, they're discovering how it was probably more about winning the hearts and minds of local people. They've uncovered the Mead Hall, where the Lord or Thane lived alongside the villagers. So if you imagine that we're standing on the line of the boundary, stretching in each direction on either side of us, in that direction, we imagine is the Grand Hall, immediately outside it, and it's immediately outside, is the village. Right, and what impresses me is just how close... I mean, the villagers could shout at their lord across here. Yes, oh, no, that's absolutely right, and very different from the, the social structure of the Roman villa estate, where the villa is in one place, and the village might be a mile away. Here you've got an integration between the elite and the ordinary villagers. Well, it is a nice picture. I mean, call me an old romantic, but I'm seeing the villagers occasionally going to the Mead Hall and, and socialising. I think that's exactly how it worked, yes. Every free man would be part of this Lord's entourage, and they would be forging a new society in the Mead Hall. I think I can put a word on this new thing, and it's Englishness. We're looking at the origins of England, aren't we? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. There's a Germanic culture, or a culture that has its roots in a Germanic past, that's being invested with new meaning by the native population. So it's actually Englishness, in a sense, which is being forged in these mead halls. The beginnings of Englishness are in a blending of cultures the original Britons who lived in these isles, and the small band of guys with big swords who came to join them from abroad. And very quickly, English identity became messier and even harder to distill. Because the Anglo-Saxons were only the first of wave upon wave of foreigners who left a profound mark on what it means to be English. And there's one small place that neatly sums it all up. This room was built by Anglo-Saxons in the 8th century. Here they buried kings from one of the greatest Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, Mercia. It's a sort of Midlands mini Westminster Abbey. And within a few decades, pilgrims were pouring into this crypt, hungry for miracles. Hot on the heels of the Anglo-Saxons came a new band of warriors in the 9th century. There's evidence for them here, too. It was discovered under the Vicarage Lawn. 
What they found here was a huge mass grave of at least 250 Vikings from Scandinavia. And in all the heap of bones, only one man was older than 45. They had found the war dead of the Viking army. And what the Vikings had done was pile all their dead comrades on the grave of one of those Christian Mercian kings. Just to make a point, the Vikings were here to stay. And the Vikings were by no means the last wave of foreigners to come and stir up English identity. The Normans came next. Repton School is built on the footprint of a 12th century Norman priory of Augustinian canons. Look at this. This is the base of a great arch which would come up like this. And this is the entrance to the canon's chapter house, their assembly hall. I love these great Norman arches. In this one Derbyshire town, it's possible to trace the diverse ingredients of English ethnicity. They may all have been white, but each wave of immigrants offered something different. From great architecture to local accents, common law to place names. The English absorbed them all, layer upon layer of rich diversity, creating a new cultural identity. Just like a fine old English lasagna or chicken tikka masala. To say that to be English is to be genetically or culturally Anglo-Saxon alone is just plain wrong. But there is another deeply ingrained tradition that to be English also means to be Christian. And a particular kind of Christian at that. It's beautifully put in that great 18th century novel Fielding's Tom Jones. Tom's tutor is a wonderfully pompous Anglican clergyman, Parson Thwackham. And in the course of an argument about religion, Parson Thwackham majestically pronounces, when I mention religion, I mean the Christian religion, and not only the Christian religion, but the Protestant religion, and not only the Protestant religion, but the Church of England. There you have it. To be truly English is to be Church of England. How true is that? This is a tradition I know very well from the inside. I grew up the son of a village parson. I used to play the organ, paid for out of the War Memorial Fund. The village chose to remember their dead, lost in two world wars, through the institution at the heart of their community. For hundreds of years, life was built around the parish church. You came here each week for Sunday services. You marked the passing seasons. The church provided the christening ritual that marked your entry into the world. This was where you'd come to get married. And after it all, this would be your final resting place. For most English people, their world was shaped by one particular sort of Christianity, an all-embracing Anglicanism. But the truth is that even as a boy sitting on that organ stool, I knew that the Church of England didn't mean the same for everyone. And actually, the seeds of division were there right from the church's earliest beginnings. The English church was born in the 16th century out of that revolution in Christianity we call the Protestant Reformation. It was set up to replace the monopoly of the Catholic church with a Protestant monopoly. But this village reveals that English Protestant Christianity refused to fit in to a single mould. In 1600, Bolsham was home to a strange and colourful religious group called the Family of Love. Allegedly, they indulged in wife-swapping, adultery and general excess. Actually, 
they were much more shocking than that. They were a mystical sect who believed that they were not just children of God, but a part of God. It's not surprising that the Familists were officially condemned as heretics. But they were not ones to stand up and get martyred. Instead, they joined the established church and used it for their own secret purposes. Something to show you down here. Historian Chris Marsh has found highly coded evidence of how they did this. It's a bit of a performance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it certainly is. Right, it's a bell, so what's so special about it? Well, three of the bells in this, this belfry date from 1609. They all have this, uh, oh, yeah, this date on them. Yeah. Um, but where the other bells have inscriptions like God save thy church, God save uh, the king, this one has a Latin inscription which translates as I sound not for the souls of the dead, but for the ears of the living. And at one level, all that is saying is that good Protestants in the early 17th century no longer pray for the souls of the dead as pre-Reformation Catholics, Catholics did. But there's a particular twist. Two of the words are reversed. Reversed? Uh, yeah. What, how do you mean? Just written backwards. Oh, yeah, right. Ri ri written backwards. So the word for souls, animabus, becomes subamina, which is a, a meaningless word in, in Latin. And the word for ears, Auribus becomes Sobirua. Souls and ears Soul, backwards. Souls and ears backwards. And maybe what he's saying is that orthodoxy has got it all all wrong. It's the other way around. Yeah. You're all obsessed with externals, with, with, with churches and true faith. It's about what goes on in your in your soul. Um, and members of the family of love were, were very kind of adept at registering these, these little kind of secret signals of, of their identity. They it's must have really smiled to themselves, mustn't they? Every time this bell rings for an Anglican service. I think it's, so, yeah. it's, it's actually bringing out their message I think so. to those who know. But what's fascinating about the Familists in Balsham is not only their sneaky subversion, but that they sometimes dared to express their heretical faith openly. When one of their leaders died in that same year, 1609, his followers took the brazen step of appropriating a medieval priest's tomb to bury him. They removed the bones of the priest who, who lay within, they put a brick vault, 600 bricks, into the ground, right. installed Thomas Lawrence, and then replaced the stones on, on top, which is an extraordinary gesture. Yeah. Um, so I guess what they're saying is that their leader is as important as the, all the priests in this graveyard from the remote past. I think that's exactly what the implication was, and not surprisingly, it provoked uh, a reaction from um, some of the other church, church officers, who clearly felt that this time the members of the family of love had gone a step too far. The squabble ended up in court, where the church warden exposed the familists as heretics. Surprisingly, they got away with it. The judge, he was informed that the two were old, that one was blind, one, one was deaf, um, and the case died. He just let it, let it go. So, the families, they're heretics, and yet they're being defended by the courts of the Church of England against people who would think that they were the backbone of the Church of England. Isn't that weird? It is, it is weird, but within the church, within society at this time, there is a sort of capacity for absorbing diversity, which most people might find really quite quite surprising. OK, you might say the Family of Love was a tiny rogue sect well outside the mainstream. But in fact, by the mid-17th century, there were hundreds of small independent Protestant groups in England, from ranters and diggers to Baptists and Unitarians. Far from being a wholly Anglican nation, the English were already a pretty mixed bunch. And that plurality of religion was stretched even further with an invitation to Protestant religious immigrants from overseas. 
My mother's family were called Chapel, and they were descended from French Protestants known as Huguenots, who suffered persecution in 17th century Catholic France. And so they fled to Protestant England with the full blessing of the church here. They brought with them their own distinctive faith, but their impact on English society was much wider than that. The Huguenots were literate, highly organised, motivated. They brought their industriousness and commercial ability to this country. The Bank of England may be the institution at the heart of the English economy, but we owe the fact it exists at all to Huguenots. Well, this is the list of subscribers who actually set up the Bank of England in 1694. And it starts with the king and queen, as you might expect. But if you turn over the pages, you start meeting Huguenots. What have I got here? I, Thomas Le Hoop of London Esquire. And then uh, I have Jean de la Parelle, also of London. And at the top, I have I, Sir John Hublon of London Knight and Alderman. And he subscribes £10,000, which it's actually the same sum that the King and Queen gave. This is a top man, and he actually became the first governor of the Bank of England. And if ever you've had a few bob, you will have met Sir John, because here he is on a £50 note. It's nice to see my ancestors doing so well. But the reason the Huguenots who came here went into banking and also commerce and manufacturing was because there were still limits to English religious plurality. The traditional professions were closed to anyone who wasn't Anglican. The Church of England was part and parcel of the establishment, but it was never the whole story. The true picture of what it meant to be English was getting complicated. Now, the authorities would have liked it to be simple, nothing else than a loyal follower of the Church of England. But there were more ways of being Christian, more ways of being English, religious pluralism, in fact. Catholics, Quakers, Baptists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, all of them managed to hold on to their beliefs. Yes, sometimes in secret, but they did it. Towards the end of the 17th century, the established church had to start facing facts. The first reality check was Parliament's Act of Toleration. This law allowed Protestant dissenters to hold their own services in the public eye without fear of prosecution. Roman Catholics, too, would be granted concessions by the end of the 18th century. But the myth that to be English was to be Anglican was finally demolished in the 19th century. The first census of church attendance in England and Wales took place in 1851. I've come to look at the results in the parliamentary archive. The figures shocked a lot of people because what they revealed was that in most large towns, more people were going to non-Church of England services than the Church of England. I mean, look here at an extreme example from Bradford. Now here, nearly three times as many people at non-Anglican services as at the Church of England. And if you took the Welsh figures, they'd be even more extreme. Now, the overall statistics, which irons out the differences between town and country or the regional variations, you get 520 out of every 1,000 church attendances are Anglican, that's 52%, which of course means that nearly as many people are not attending Church of England services. With so many not going to the established church, the idea that it was ever the only way to be English just doesn't stand up. 
The irony is that ringing out from Anglican church towers is a sound which, to my mind, rather charmingly captures the plural nature of English Christianity. In the centuries of medieval Catholicism, English bells were simply rung out in a great random noise, just as they were in every other part of Catholic Europe. But after the Reformation, Protestants developed a uniquely English game for ringing bells. It had very formal rules, but its hallmark was change, reinvention, difference. Well, we start off with ringing what we call rounds, which is ringing down the scale from the highest note down to the heaviest note. Uh, and Jane's going to start us off with that. Ooh, trouble's going. Gone. And from there, we can then change the sequence or the order of the bells. So, for example, I'll start by saying three to four, and bells three and four will swap over. And from there, I can change the order again and again and again, as long as we can... As, as long as you like, really. As, as much as the neighbours will tolerate it. <laughs> OK. And we'll show you what we mean. Gone. Two to four. So then we swap bells two and four over. Let's change the order. Two to three. And that swaps bells two and three over. Four to two. You can go on ringing the changes for hours. Trust me, the math does work. Three to two. And for nearly 500 years, all of English Christianity has been like this. A continuous reinvention of something much older. You can see it in the nation's plethora of chapels and meeting houses. And every new group changed the Church of England, forcing it bit by bit to become a broader church, embracing difference. But one key battle remained before it could truly call itself a broad church. This time, the struggle for religious plurality reached right to the gates of the church in every sense. The outcome would set the tone for the future of English identity. Fight centred on the all-important question of death. 150 years ago, in most corners of this country, you could only get to heaven with the blessing of the Church of England. If you were not an Anglican, you might not be able to bury your loved ones in the way you wanted. That implied that you weren't as English as the Anglicans. And this was precisely the situation facing one family who turned their backs on the Church of England. Well, here we are, the churchyard gate at Aitnham. So, Nicholas, tell me a bit about religious life in Aitnham in the 19th century. Aitnham, I think, in the 19th century was a somewhat unusual village. Um, there were very few Anglicans, if any. Um, the two major landowners were both Congregationalists, went to chapel in Ipswich, and took their labourers with them on a Sunday morning on carts. So there were hardly any services in the church at all. And what was the row here? This particular row was over the burial of a, of, of a baby. Um, a two-year-old child who was, in fact, not a Congregationalist, but a Baptist. Oh, a Baptist. So much worse than being a Congregationalist, because he wouldn't have been baptised at all. Baptists don't baptise until you're of a, an age of discretion to take it on yourself. So, no, two years old, he was not baptised. So what would that mean in terms of a funeral? It meant that he was entitled to burial in the churchyard as a parishioner, but that no service could be read over the child at all. 
This all made for a cold way to mark the passing of a child. The family felt passionately that their right to a proper ceremony was being denied. So they decided to defy the parish's Anglican clergyman, Father George Drury. The boy came in his coffin from the direction of the village. Um, at the same time, the two main landowners, together with one of the congregational ministers from Ipswich, came across the field behind us um, to meet them here to conduct a service, which they were going to do in the field. And this is the thing that upset Drury. He said, no, I want to bury the boy, then you can have your service. They were quite determined to have the service before the burial. What a mess at a child's funeral. It was outrageous. I mean, they came to blows almost. Um, whether one of them actually hit the other is a matter of opinion. Father Drury was so outraged by the open challenge that he locked the churchyard gate and walked off. The funeral party was left to push their way through the hedge and bury the child themselves in the allotted spot, on the north, unfavoured side of the church. Look at the inscription below. Yes. Suffer little children, for forbid them not to come unto me. Now that's pretty pointed, it's isn't it? It's very pointed, I think, after what went on here. Yeah. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> It's a rotten story, but really, Father Drury was within his rights, wasn't he, legally? He was. Um, he maybe overstepped the mark by trying to interrupt the service that was going on in the lane, which was legal, if unusual. But if he had had his way, the child would have been put in the grave, Drury would have thrown in a handful of soil and just walked off. No prayers, no nothing, because as far as he was concerned, the child was not a Christian. Even so, it's not good publicity for the Church of England, it's is it? It's not at all, no. Um, it got itself into all the local papers. There, there, there was a very, very detailed account of it um, within a couple of days, um, taking the place to pieces. There was some strong language in the local press, particularly on the letters page. Here's Mr. John Skeet of Rushmere on the subject of the burial legislation. Vile, monstrous law, foul blot and stain on fair England statute book. Will Englishmen continue cruelly to allow such a vile abomination? Well, Drury himself came in for some hard words and he actually sued a local newspaper proprietor and he won his case, but only with token damages. And now the whole thing had become a national scandal. This is what the standard had to say about it. The unhappy differences, religious and political, which together constitute what is commonly known as the burial question, have never led to a scandal more painful and revolting. Public opinion was on the side of the nonconformists. They had challenged the privilege of the established church, and now there were calls to change the law. But the church was not going to back down without a fight. There was actually a very great head of steam among the Anglican clergy about this. 15,000 of them, that's 75%, signed a petition against any change in the burial laws because they felt that nonconformists were trying to hijack their churchyards. But it was no good. In 1880, the Burial Law Reform Act was passed. From now on, nonconformists could choose who buried them. I think the Akenham affair tells us a lot about the established church in England. It hated seeing its position challenged. Every concession was given as grudgingly as you can get. But despite itself, the church, time and again, gave in. It's almost become part of its DNA, slowly and untidily to pave the way for more and more degrees of pluralism. Mercy upon you. What I hope to have shown you is that the measure of Englishness is not about how Anglo-Saxon you are. English heritage is in fact much more diverse, embracing gifts from the original British, or Spaniards if you prefer, the Scandinavians, the French. And while in nearly all Western Europe established churches enforced a religious monopoly, the church in England never came close. 
from Catholics to Baptists, Huguenots and Familists, all would be accepted as English. So, to answer a big question, Englishness is a broad church. And yet, right up to the middle of the 20th century, some still clung to a facade of Englishness that was anything but diverse. What happened in the second half of the century would change all that. Worshippers gather for Ganesh Chaturthi, the birthday of Lord Ganesh. It's a joyful ten-day festival, and at the end of it, Hindus from across the north of England head for one place. Lord Ganesh must be immersed in flowing water, and so for this day, the River Mersey is affectionately renamed the Ganges of the North. This exuberant Hindu festival is one of many new expressions of Englishness. Since the end of the British Empire, thousands of immigrants, non-white and non-Christian, have come to Britain. They've made this country, and especially England, where most have settled, more varied than ever. I'm coming here today to thank Lord Ganesh for helping me with my GCSE results. I've been really successful and I'd just like to thank God again. It means a lot to me. It's, it's such a joyous occasion for the whole family to get this, the whole community to get together. And just this, this just tops it off. Even though history shows us that to be English is to be diverse, the wealth of new cultures in 21st century England is posing a challenge. This plural society is at a crossroads. The English have become so diverse that they're confused about who they are. They're facing an identity crisis. I think part of the reason may be the English approach to multiculturalism, which has allowed separate communities to develop in isolation from one another. There's no shared identity. If you don't have one system of values for everyone to buy into, then you create a void. And into that void rush all sorts of passionate opinions, like air into a vacuum, hot air in fact. So, in England, we have Islamism, Christian fundamentalism, nationalist political parties. Extremists are a tiny minority, but the effect of their actions is massive. I've watched one possible response to that threat emerging in England. You might call it secular liberalism. The idea is that you confine religion to the private sphere and you don't promote any alternative values beyond the general notion of liberty and tolerance. In a multicultural society, you can see why this resolute rejection of public religion might seem a good thing. But there's an underlying problem for a nation which must tolerate all views. How does a liberal society resist extremism if its only ultimate value is toleration? Is it actually entitled to resist extremism? It's a big dilemma. <laughs> so how might we get round it? I believe the answer lies in the opposite direction to secularism. If you try to keep religion entirely private, you ignore the lessons of the past. No secular society, despite its best efforts, has ever managed to squash deeply held faith. What it needs to do is find ways of coming to terms with religious diversity. 
And one institution has already managed that. It's the Church of England. How many times have I heard the C of E being sneered at for being woolly or irrelevant? Well, in fact, history has taught the church how to compromise and live with opposing points of view. I see the Church of England as an icon of English plurality, and its best symbol is its quiver full of cathedrals, like this one, here in Leicester. This ancient building is on the front line of this very contemporary struggle between extremism and tolerance. In 2010, the English Defence League, which says it's opposed to Islamic extremism, came to Leicester. In response, all the city's faith communities came together, along with civic leaders. They held a multi-faith vigil in the cathedral. I find it very satisfying to see a cathedral reclaiming the role for which they're intended, to be a mother church for their area. But there's another thing about cathedrals. They're an image of something very precious that the Church of England has to offer. A sense of a strong national framework that has survived everything that history could throw at it. In towns and villages across England, the church still has an unparalleled presence. Because there is an established church, every square foot of English soil remains in an Anglican parish. For centuries, this umbrella organisation has been learning how to offer very different communities up and down the nation a set of shared core values, a public moral consciousness that goes beyond denomination or creed. Today, in our hugely varied and sometimes badly divided communities, there's a real need for a local arbiter that can act on behalf of people of different faiths and none, which communities can unite around, irrespective of their faith. The Church of England is uniquely placed to meet that need. But can it? I've come to talk to the head of the church about how it's been trying sometimes only to get its fingers badly burned. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Rowan Williams, sparked a huge row with comments which seemed to support the introduction of Islamic Sharia law into British law. Diverse and overlapping affiliations work. The row was a complete distraction from the far more important issues which the Archbishop was tackling. In his comments on Sharia law, I think that Rowan Williams was trying to address the problems of contemporary England and getting us to talk about them. That is what I believe the Church of England has done for centuries and what it should go on doing. I, I was very interested by the kerfuffle around your comments on Sharia law, and it, it's not <laughs> so, so much. Yeah, yeah, it's not so much mm. what you said and what the react mm. and the, the the things which people said back, but the fact that there could be such a fuss mm. about such mm. comments. What, what, what's your feeling about that? Looking back on it, I think there was quite a strong feeling in some quarters that. Uh, the Archbishop of the Established Church ought to be defending the Established Church against other religions, whereas I think I was working on the assumption that part of my job as Archbishop in the Established Church was to, to ask how the society as a whole could be hospitable towards the minorities within it, that that's the role of brokering, the role of drawing people into a conversation. So I think there was quite a mismatch of expectation there. And actually, in a, in a rather odd way, the, the idea that the Archbishop ought to be speaking in defence of the established church against others is not one that many within the established church would, would recognise, partly because of the sort of experience they have on the ground at the grassroots in the communities of Birmingham or Leicester or Bradford or whatever. I'm thinking of secularists who would say the Church of England has no place, it has no role now. So what what would happen if you, if you subtracted the Church of England from the equation, from society now, what difference would it make? I, 
think it would make a difference at two levels at least. One of those levels is the purely personal or, or pastoral level. There would be no obvious place to go to, let's say, to commemorate the victims of the 7-7 bombings, no obvious place to go locally when people have been through a trauma. At the, the broader level, the higher level, I think what would be missed is some sense that the religious perspective in the broadest sense of all is a proper part of public discussion. It's not there to dominate, it's not there to give all the answers, but it's there recognizing that here is a hugely important dimension of human experience, which if you don't factor into public discussion, will as well go underground and become more bigoted, more introverted, more problematic. Bring it into the public discussion and actually everybody, everybody wins, I think. The Archbishop sees his role as a broker of all religious points of view in society, rather than as a defender of one church. He doesn't want the religious voice to dominate, but he does want it to be heard. He thinks it's essential to bringing people together in a plural society. And he believes that his church is ideally positioned to take the lead. It is, in fact, the kind of work in which the Church of England is constantly engaged. Recognising that in our complex societies, there are many different beliefs, values and moral systems. And that's why it's such a privilege and a joy for people of different faiths and backgrounds and cultures and creeds to come together in this cathedral today. This is an idea that goes against the prevailing wisdom of secularism. And yet the evidence of this series is that it might just work. For what I've found is that religion and what it means to be English are closely intertwined. The church created the sense that the English are somehow destined to play a big role on the world stage. Behind that sense, lurks the belief that God is on the side of England. The fact that the English have finally become a tolerant nation, indifferent to difference, has been born out of their religious past. A messy, tangled history to be sure, but religious nevertheless. After all that, after all the muddled history, the ups and downs, the bads and the goods, the shameful and the creditable, we have a result which really might have something to teach the world. To be English is to be diverse, to be a broad church, and that's because there is a broad church at the heart of the nation. We need to stand up to those who claim to own the past just so that they can misuse it for their own intolerant purposes. Let's reclaim that past and then we will discover what it is to be English.